Hey everybody, I'm Amanda with DevExpress and welcome to today's webinar, Getting Started with the DevExpress Report Server, presented by DevExpress Technical Evangelist, Don Wibier. In today's session, he'll show you how to scale out your application's reporting facilities by using the DevExpress Report Server, plus learn how to install and configure the server and how to change your application to process through the server. This session is being recorded and it will be made available on our DevExpress YouTube channel. We will also do a live Q&A at the end of this presentation. Just type your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel at any time throughout the broadcast. All right, thank you so much for joining us. I will now hand things over to Don. Thanks, Amanda, and uh, welcome, everybody. Today, I'm going to talk about the DevExpress Report Server. Um, and, well, you probably know DevExpress from its UI components for various platforms. But if you would take a look on our website at the products menu item, you see a section enterprise tools, uh, which has two products, namely the report server and the analytics dashboard. And well, today we're going to talk about the report server. We've taken our own technology and turned it into a complete product, which you can just install and run on a server without the need for Visual Studio. The report server allows your end users to design reports through a web interface or a Windows dashboard instead of contacting your IT department to create yet another report definition. The reporting server is specifically interesting for processing huge amounts of data and reporting that needs to be done on, for instance, a daily base. The server is easily installed and configured in contrast to some competitive products, and it supports more than a dozen database backends to fully support your end user demands. Besides all of this, the server comes with an API which allows you, the developer, to connect your desktop application with the server to handle reporting. And I'll show how that goes later on in the webinar. Well, I've put together a small agenda with a number of items that I'm going to discuss. Um, and, well, I'll be talking about the installation. I will not proceed with the actual install because I already did it. Uh, but I will talk a bit about configuring. Uh, next, I'll, uh, I'll be talking about defining some data sources on the report server. And we'll be showing a bit about um, defining report definitions, so designing a report, binding it to a data source, etc. And well, then probably the most important thing on this whole report server is running the reporting jobs as well as scheduling it through tasks. And the last thing I'm going to show is how you can integrate the report server functionality within your own desktop application. So I will be showing a bit of Visual Studio in the end, but uh, let's start with the, with the first items here, which is installing and configuring. Well, the installer is a pretty straightforward uh, executable that you can run on the, on the server that you want to handle the reporting. And because we are creating a web interface, the report server has a web interface which will be installed nicely into IIS. There are a couple of prerequisites that you will need to have installed on the server. And, well, I will not show you the exact installer process, but once the installer starts, you can actually get a message if you didn't install everything on the Windows machine that was required. And in this case, you can actually see that there are a couple of things that were not uh, matched, which were, in my case, the HTTP error section as well as the Windows authentication, because the, reporting serve, the report server will um, authenticate its users through either Windows authentication or Windows Forms authentication, but a bit more about that later. Well, and in my particular case, it was uh, pretty simple to solve. I just went to the Windows features and turned a couple of features on, which were off by default. Um, well, and after this 
uh, installer finished, the Windows Features installer, I restarted the installation again and everything would be installed. Um, after the installer finishes, you will uh, be entering the administrative interface of the report server. And that is something which looks like this. Let me begin from the start. So in this particular case, you see uh, the main interface of the report server. What you also see is because I used integrated Windows authentication that I have been authenticated uh, with my username here. Um, so that doesn't, for me, I don't need to authorize it again once I enter this administrative interface. Well, before we can start, there are a couple of things that should be checked because the report server works in the background. Uh, there are a couple of things going on. So while while processing, processing a job, it, will send out a, it can send out an email uh, that the job will start or that the job has been finished, etc. And for that to happen, it is necessary to check a number of global settings in the report server. And that can be done by clicking this little settings button. And, well, to have the emails be sent out, it is important that you will configure the SMTP server here. So in this case, I have installed a small SMTP, SMTP uh, mail server on my, on my development machine, so this will be my host. Uh, I don't need to authenticate, um, and once you have set up everything um, to your best needs, you can actually send a test mail to yourself. Well, and in this case, a test email has been sent to your mail address. And what is my mail address? You can specify that in your user settings. In this case, I have specified a Gmail account and I will also get that email delivered on my Gmail account. So this is a message which comes in after hitting that test button and it says the report server confirms that the settings are successfully entered. And with this in place we can start doing some background processing basically. A couple of other things which are nice to, uh, to configure and which are worth mentioning is uh, something which comes with the report server. It, um, and that is email templates. As I mentioned before, there are the report server um, holds a number of users uh, which are able to do certain things on this server. And well, such a user could, for instance, lose his password. And for that, we would have a, an email template which allows us to reset a password. Um, and those email templates can be customized here. So for instance, if I want to re, uh, change the reset passwords email, we'll have a little email template here. As you can see, we already pre-filled it with some uh, information for you. And a couple of points worth in mentioning here are those texts between the hash signs. Uh, those tokens are basically message parameters which can be found in this list. For this particular email templates, there are three parameters, which are the username, the login name, and the link. But if I go to one of the other ones, for instance, I want to have an activate account email, you will see that there are some other parameters. So those parameters depend on the scope in which the mail will be sent. Well, as I mentioned, we pre-filled it all for you, but you can customize it to whatever you want, um, but it's nice to know that it is possible to customize those emails. Another thing that can be viewed here is the status information, and this is only some, some information which will be shown. The way that the report server works is that it needs client access licenses, so for every user 
you have configured on the report server, it needs a client access license. And when you have a universal subscription, you'll have the report server and that comes with five client access licenses. If you purchase the report server separately, you'll get 15 client access licenses. And in this case, I have created one user which will be myself. So I have four licenses left. Um, and the total license count is, is stated as well. So just some information. And the last thing that can be customized or configured are the validation key and the decryption key that are used when you use forms authentication and uh, the website needs to encrypt certain information. It will use these keys to validate and encrypt the data. You can customize it, but we have pre-filled it with some random values for you anyway. So these are the server settings which uh, yeah, you should check out, specifically the mail settings. Well, with this in place, we can uh, take a look at a couple of things on the main menu here. For instance, we have the user accounts section. In this area, you can configure your users. So the people are, that are allowed to log on to the report server and do certain things. If I add an account, it will decrease my available licenses, as you can see. Um, and, well, this basically speaks for itself. You can uh, enter a username and you can actually assign this user to a specific group. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We have a number of predefined groups where users can belong to, which give them uh, yeah, specific rights within the report server. Well, I did talk about those groups. Uh, we already pre-configured a number of groups which are basically stated here. So the report creators, report viewers, system administrators, and data administrators. And by using these groups, you can, for instance, assign rights to a specific user who is only able to make changes to the data model. Or somebody is only allowed to generate reports and view the information and is unable to restyle one of the reports. So you can, you can fine-tune those rights to specific users um, yeah, geared towards your scenario. And if I would check out one of those, in this case, if I check the permissions of the report creators, we'll see that they have full access to all reports, report categories, to all tasks, and they can read data models. So they can use the data models to generate reports, but they are unable to create new data sources. And I'll get to the data sources in just a couple of moments. Well, you can add permissions yeah, geared towards your business scenario. So you can actually say, I want to give somebody a read or read modify, etc., to a certain element here. And in this case, I could say I want to have this access mode to a specific report, for instance. And then, yeah, that, that specific report needs a scope, like what specific report. In this case, I have already configured one report, and that would be the scope in this scenario. So it gives you uh, a bit of flexibility on who is allowed to do what. Well, before I go over to the reports and the data models uh, and the scheduling, I'll first quickly touch the categories. That's pretty straightforward. It allows you to group certain reports uh, and assign a category to them. So you can look them up fast. If you have a whole bunch of reports, it's just a way of organizing your reports, basically. Um, well, the next link is the reports, but before I go there, I'll first go to the data models because that is something which needs to be set up first. Before we can do anything with reports, we need to define the data the reports are going to work with. So, the data models tab has a list of connections and 
I have configured already one of the connections. In this case, I will be using the Chinook database, which is a free-to-use database filled with some music, music tracks and artists. It even has some invoicing information, and it's just a sample database to get you going with some data. But you can easily add as many data sources or data models as you like. And the cool thing with the report server is, as I mentioned in the introduction, it has support for a dozen different database backends. So we do not only support Microsoft SQL Server, but if you have something running on MySQL or even Oracle or Postgres or, well, you name it, the list is long. And that is because we are using our own data technology, which is used in pers uh, Express Persistent Objects as well. And that is also supporting these kind of databases. So you can, you can use this report server on quite a variety on backends. And it's getting, it gets even better. I'm going to show that in a minute. The only thing you need to specify here is the connection string. And the connection string is something which is uh, well known to all you .NET developers. Uh, it's something which comes in the app.config or the web.config, uh, which is um, the ADO connection string. So I'm going to leave this one for what it is right now. I'll head back to the one that I previously configured. And in this case, you can actually check uh, what the connection string looks like. Uh, let me get back and edit it. So it's going to be this one. So uh, this is something well known to you. And for the other database backends, uh, we have some documentation available on how those connection strings should look to, for instance, connect to an SQL anywhere or a Postgres SQL database, etc. All right. You also you already saw me clicking the second button, and that is actually the construction of queries within this data model. And I have configured two queries already. Uh, one is uh, the new query, which is returning some invoicing information, which comes out of the database. Uh, the other one is a track query. And well, let me open that one up. Uh, sorry, let me uh, edit one of the queries. So in this particular case, I can uh, add a number of columns here, but I can remove uh, columns from the result set as well. Um, but let me add a new query. And what happens now is that you will get a full data SQL designer, which allows you to visually create all kinds of queries. So let me create a new query here, and it's going to be the artist query. I will not do anything with the filter right now. I'll come to that later. And what you see here is that we have all the tables that are in my Chinook database. So I've got albums, I've got artists, I even have customers, employees, and I have uh, some tracks, and I even have playlists. But anyway, I was going to do an artist query. So let me drag that one in. Here we are. And I might want to have some other information in there as well, which is coming from another uh, one of the other entities. So I could say, give me an album as well. Well, what you see here is that a relationship has already been set up uh, because this is already in the database uh, as well. So there is a foreign key with it. And I can now select any of the columns that I'd like. So in this case, I have the artist ID and the name. And I would also like the album ID and the title. And if I want to view how this is going to look, 
I'm going to have all the titles here with the artists and well the name might not be really good so I can now actually go to this particular artist and change the alias to artist well in case I want to change the title of the album as well it makes sense to uh, change that on the alias as well once we have created our query, we'll be able to uh, save that by hitting the Save button. And I named this the Artist Query. Uh, I could have better renamed it to Album Query because it's querying the albums together with the artists. But um, yeah, this is just for demo purposes, obviously. So what I have here is, if I collapse it, you'll have all the fields that are visible, which are returned from the query. And I can now actually use this query in one of the reports. So once I'm done, I can now head over to the Reports tab and start creating a report. So. The report section holds all the report definitions that are configured on this server. And I already configured one and I can also process this report right now and see what the results is. And this query was based on the invoicing data which is also in the same database. And the report is now being processed on the server and the output is being displayed in my browser. And this is basically a very simple and straightforward report with all the fields of that query. But what you see here is a web version of our report viewer where I can just browse the pages. I can even change the setup to two pages in one row. Um, and I could decide to print it or even export it to a format that we support. But let's create a new report and uh, that is being done by just clicking that plus button and the first, well you can actually start this report from scratch like what we see here, you can configure all the bands, the top margins, etc, assign data sources to the report and you can do whatever you want. There is a simpler way by just hitting the menu here and design in the report wizard. I'm going to make a data bound report here and it will show all the queries that were defined on the report server and in this case I would go for the artist query and I will have all the fields that are available. I could use some grouping like I want to have all the albums grouped by artist or something but you know what I'm not going to do it. I'll just hit next and well you can choose what kind of uh, report you want to have so in this case I'll hit next next and I'll give it a title so this will be my album uh, report And now this report has been created and it will be saved to the report server as well. And if I want to see how this report is going to look, I can just hit the button and it's being processed on the server so your workstation will not be impacted in any way because it's all being processed on the server. And even if it has like a million records, well, the speed depends on the size of your server basically. Once I'm done with this uh, designer and what you see here is a whole bunch of controls that you can just drag in and you can bind it to data or you can just fill the property. So if you want to have an image on there you can simply drag it on and uh, put it somewhere here. Well this is in the margin so that wouldn't be a great idea. And well now you can actually bind it to some image and well in most scenarios you would probably bind it to some image which is stored in a data set as well. 
But uh, this is basically how simple you can design the report. So in this case, if I drag on a label here, it's going to be label 10. And you'll see that on every page there is this label 10 right now. Once I hit the design button again, I'll be able to save this and it will be um, and I can upload it to the server right now. So this is going to be the album query. Here you can also assign one of those categories I was mentioning before. Um, and you can enter some description as well as a revision comment. Once we are finished here and I go back to this uh, particular page, I do need to refresh this, but you will see that we have the album query as well. And it's actually the album, uh, the album report, obviously. But anyway, this is one way of defining those uh, report definitions. Once you install the report server, you also have the ability to install an additional tool, and that is our WinForms version of the reporting of the report designer. And I will start that one up right now. This is it. It is already connected to my uh, reporting server, and this allows me to open up. Let me first close down this one. Let me open a report from the server. So I just created this album query report. And what you see here is a list of all available reports that are configured on the server. So if I would now open up the album query, we'll see exactly the same as that you already saw in the web designer. And I'll be able to just remove that label again because I didn't like it that much and I'm also able to process, process that report and make a preview which will look like this so this is this is an additional tool that comes with the report server and it will obviously check the user rights of the user being logged on uh, and it will yeah, determine whether you are allowed to modify or uh, design any of the reports. Once we are done with modifying this particular report, we need to save that back to the server. And we need to additionally check this report in, because at the current stage, this report has been blocked for, from editing from other users because I opened it and I started editing. So this is much like a version control system, basically. I can now check in the report, and it even gives me a comment, so I can enter a comment, just like in a TOS or a Git, and I can now say label 10 was removed. At this stage, the, the report has been unlocked and somebody else is able to open it or uh, modify it again. If I now run this report again on the web interface, you'll see that that label 10 has disappeared. So this is um, yeah this this gives you a number of ways of defining these reports and uh, yeah you can hand this this kind of tools over to your end users to to start constructing reports based on the data that you have provided. Well, one of the things which is uh, also very interesting is that suppose you want to have a report already run on like millions of records of data and you want to have it on your desk at 9 in the morning or even 8 in the morning, you can set up a scheduling task which will kick off the generation of the report and it will be finished hopefully before 8 or 9. 
depending on the amount of data, obviously. And this is something which can be done with the scheduling tab. So in this case, I have already set up a test invoice job, which will do that, that uh, first query that I designed. But I could add an additional task here, um, which gives me the possibility to give a, uh, another task on albums. And here I can select one of the reports, and in this case I will go for the album query report. And once this has been finished, I can decide whether to send an email with the entire report in there, or I could send out a URL to preview the report. And I could also embed the HTML. So if it is like a lot of data, I wouldn't recommend going for the embed HTML because you get like a really big email. And if you want to use the URL to preview the report, you should be aware of the fact that your report server should be accessible by a well public domain or at least a domain that is accessible for your end users. So in my case, localhost will not do the trick unless I read it on my local machine. So, yeah, I guess, but it also depends on the size of the generated PDF or Excel workbook, you would have an attached PDF or an, an attached workbook for Excel. But anyway, that, those are a couple of considerations that you can make up your mind about yourself. So, I can now use the URL because I will be the only one seeing it, and I will send this as individual emails. Well, this is also a consideration. If you're sending this job to a number of colleagues, you could use the list all in the to section, and that means that basically one email has, will be sent with a list of email addresses in the to section. While if you send this report to a number of different people which should not be aware maybe of each other's contacting details, you never know you might want to send it out as an individual email because in that case if you have like a hundred recipients a hundred emails will be sent from within the report server so they all get an individual email. So a consideration to make for you. Uh, well, we can next specify a start date and a start time together with a reoccurrence um, pattern um, this looks a bit like a cron pattern, which is frequently used in uh, Linux-based scheduling tools. But here I can specify whether I want to happen daily, weekly, monthly, or yearly, and uh, if there is uh, some end date. Well, in this case, I want to have it every day, and I want to have it sent out like now, and it can end after one time. So in this particular case, I will always get one of those emails um, because I am an internal subscriber and I was the person who created this particular um, job. But more interesting, you can assign a number of external subscribers and in this case this is a common separated list with email addresses that you can specify. And the last thing which might be convenient as well is that you might want to export the reporting uh, results so that would be a PDF or an Excel sheet or whatever. You might want to store that to some share on some server as well and you can use a number of parameters again. So, for instance, you can specify hash year hash and hash month hash and that will be replaced by the month and the year, etc. to make like unique report file names. In case you are working with report parameters, you can also specify those parameters here. Uh, I did I didn't use any of those, but yeah, you could, for instance, create a query which will query everything from yesterday, for instance. So that can be automated in the in the designer. And the general things 
were already uh, mentioned here, so that's the, uh, the schedule parameters. So once I hit save, I'll be able to execute it as well. And well, I'm going to I'm going to send it only to myself. And you should be aware of the fact that it could take a bit of time before you get the email. Also, if you have only one email address, so for that reason, I didn't want to risk it like that you were not going to see the results. So I sent out one of those tasks before the webinar started because it will be running in a low priority thread somewhere on the server, so it can take a bit of time before this actually shows up. And well, if I go to my to my Gmail account, which I use for this kind of uh, tests, we'll have something here, which was the, uh, the test message that I sent out during the webinar. And we'll have an email which says that the report has successfully been generated. Well, I decided to use that link, but if I hover over this, you'll see that it is pointing to the local host. If you check my, my status bar at the browser, can't do it right now, or the link is gone. So in this case, if I click it, it will work. But you should be aware that if you, if you use this approach, you should have like a public uh, or at least a network visible domain name, which is bound to this particular report server. Now what you see is that it will be redirected to this, in this case, local host. Um, and then you'll have to generate a reports URL here. So this is basically how this works when uh, setting up a uh, job and a task. All right, so I've shown you quite a bit about the whole report server and it enables you to, without doing any Visual Studio work, to set up this, this whole report system, but uh, yeah, you obviously want to see some Visual Studio stuff as well, so I'm going to show you how to integrate your, uh, the report server with um, your own application. So for that I have started up a Visual Studio instance here, and I'm going to create a new project. Uh, I will use the Dev Express template gallery um, and I will create, it doesn't really matter what you try to use, you can use WinForms, you can use WPF, etc. They all use the same approach. I'm going to do the WinForms one because it's on there and I'm going to create a blank application. Well, once the application stands, there will be one form and I'm going to I'm going to put a report viewer control on there, which allows me to view generated reports generated on the report server. So the way that that works is, I have to say it's pretty cool, because it also works design time. So let me put that form here, and I'm going to put on a document viewer control, which comes with DevExpress, in this case, 16.1. So once I put it on there, it gives me the message, we have not anything in this document viewer. So what I can do here is, let me first create a ribbon toolbar which works nicely with the uh, document viewer by accessing this task. And what we do is we'll configure a ribbon control for you bounded to specific actions of the document viewer. Also, we bind the enabled states to specific uh, states within the document viewer and you don't need to do anything for it. We even provide you with the glyphs. And once I hit this task button again, I can assign a document source. In this particular case, I'm going to use one of the standard data sources and I'm going to use a remote document source. It will pop up a small little dialog here and I will go for the report server. That's going to be my source. 
Well, I can now enter the address of the server, and in my case, it was going to be localhost port 83. So let me just select that. I used authentic authentication type window, so that's fine with me. And I can now hit next. And watch what happens. We are now querying the report server, design time. It gives us a list with available reports for me, and I'll be able to select one of them. Well, we do need a couple of configuration settings like what's the location of the server uh, and a couple of more things. So we actually can generate it for you in the app.config file. And once I click finish, we'll have the ability in our own application to view a report from the server. So if I start the application, it will obviously show on one of my other screens. I'll drag it in here. So here we have the application and as you can see, we have the report already on the screen. And also, what's the ribbon control? Because I can go hit next page, hit next page, go to the last page, or I want to show a couple of pages here, like uh, two by two or something. I didn't do any coding for it, and it just works out of the box. So I'd say a pretty nice feature. And it's got, yeah. All, all features that you would imagine on a document viewer. It even gives you the possibility to export it to, to any of the formats that we support. So, yeah, I'd say that was a quick, a quick win on this particular application. There are obviously more things that you can do with it, but this will be a bit out of scope of this webinar because the report server has an entire API and we also have some pretty good documentation. So for instance, you might want to have a form which holds a list with, a, with all the reports that are defined on the server and whenever you select one of them in a the list box or whatever, I'll have my report viewer updated. So you can actually create a Windows application which allows you to browse through your reports. And we've got some, some pretty good documentation in our help section as well as, uh, as a demo application on how to approach that. So that is, that is pretty, pretty well done. Um, yeah, so, and this works with WPF as well. Well, and I guess with, uh, with this last demo, uh, Amanda, are there any questions? Hey, Don. Um, well, we did have quite a few questions come in, um, but the uh, report server team has answered everything while you've been presenting. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well done, guys. Um, let's see if anything new has come in. I mean, of course, people always ask about the license. Um, see, Patrick asked if it's yearly and the uh, the team said, yes, the subscription includes a year of technical support and two major updates. Um, and yeah, that looks like about it. All right. Well, I think we have to introduce the next webinar for next week then. We can talk <laughs> for a couple of minutes about it. Uh, yeah, perfect. So um, obviously you can visit devexpress.com slash webinars. Uh, to uh, check out upcoming sessions, and you can also watch all of our previously recorded sessions there as well. Um, Don brings this up because he's also presenting next week's webinar, Rock Your WinForms app, Apps with DevExpress MVVM. Don, you want to talk about what you're going to present next week? Yeah, that is going to be a really cool webinar, I have to say. Uh, I've done a webinar on our MVVM framework, which uh, was based on WPF, but this, uh, and I did it like a month ago, I think. Mm -hmm. um, well, this framework actually works with our WinForms controls as well, so I'm going to be showing you how to approach the MVVM design pattern on your WinForms applications with the same framework 
put a couple of tricks in there and yeah that will be really nice yeah cool so for all wind farms developers check out that webinar as well because uh, that's going to be cool um, and that is next Tuesday, November 1st at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And then on November 3rd, next Thursday, Getting Started with Dev Extreme Web, uh, presented by Julian Bucknell and Paul Usher. Uh, for many developers, the prospect of moving to a purely client-side user interface can be daunting. This presentation is intended to take away any uncertainties or worries you may have. Uh, you can join Julian and Paul as they show how to apply your existing C-sharp or VB skills in a rich client-side application. So that is next Thursday, and then Don's MVVM is next Tuesday, November 1st. All right. Um, all right, Don, thank you so much. You're welcome, Amanda, and uh, yeah, thanks for uh, watching the webinar. <laughs> we'll talk to you next week. All right, everybody. Like I mentioned previously, today's webinar will also be available on our Direct Express YouTube channel. I posted the link in the chat box. And that is it for this one. Thank you so much to Don. Thank you all for joining us. And of course, thank you for choosing DevExpress. Bye-bye.